Uh, good afternoon. Uh, this, this is Dave Hybrax. I'm here together with um, quite an uh, interesting group, uh, Stephen Curtis, Jeff Pack, and uh, Robert de Vries. Um, they're all made their hands dir dirty on data. So I think we have, uh, we'll have an interesting session uh, today. If we can, uh, and, and, and welcome to all of you. Um, this is uh, just to put the, the uh, webinar into perspective. We've run two playbooks already. This is number three. Playbook one was on uh, on uh, tax automation in the year 2020. So it explained to everyone the the, the companies uh, have to have something added to tax, which is called technology. For that, you need to have a plan. And uh, it, as part of the plan, you need to address the why um, and, and the whole transformation and change management around that. So almost like a stepping stone number one. Um, playbook two was about, okay, once you automate things and you start using automation in a, in a more uh, structural way, then um, we talked about this in, in playbook two on the next generation of uh, compliance factories. So basically, you try to uh, enhance the interaction between the human brain and the brain of computers uh, to run your as-is um, compliance as, as efficient as possible. And then uh, last but not least, uh, obviously, at that point in time, you've collected a lot of data. What are you going to do with that data? And that's, that's why we said, OK, we have uh, the, the the tax data and business uh, data analytics as a last step where, in my belief, uh, sometimes tax data analytics can be seen as the, the, the new or next generation of uh, uh, tax risk management, so another word for tax risk management. Um, I think uh, in, in setting the scene is uh, also important that a lot of uh, people uh, on the call are already collecting data, are already analyzing data, um, uh, storing data, and extracting data. Um, I, I think this call, uh, this this webinar, tries to share with you a few of the best practices of how to even do it in a better or more structured manner. I think that's that's uh, what what it's uh, what's in it for you. Uh, we try to. Um, uh, as, as it says, prepare and harness uh, business data for tax uh, and, and uh, the uh, introduction uh, um, means that, that people like Robert, uh, Jeff and, uh, and Stephen have been working their whole lives with data in, on the crossroad of data and, um, and tax. So with that, I'm looking at the next slide. Um, so this is uh, what what we just addressed. Um, the next slide, please. Uh, this is the team uh, where we represent about 5,000 plus professionals. This is the uh, companies who've been uh, um, supporting. So uh, Robert at Exnilio, um, Jeff at Popow, and um, and Stephen at uh, Cross Border Analytics uh, were participating in also the preparation. BadUpdate.com, uh, TTI, and Signet are other players in this field we uh, we work together with. Next slide. Um, next slide, please. So here I would like to give the floor to Robert uh, to address the why. Uh, we are doing data analytics. Uh, Robert, the floor is yours. Thanks, Dave. Uh, so when we talk about uh, data management and data analytics is where we look at that we try to discover uh, as a lot of value in the data we have. But of course, we can only have a positive return on investment from the data when we know sure that our data is accurate, that our data is uh, complete. So that is first what we need to determine if we can use the data. And that is what you see. A lot of companies work with data, do not understand that if you have bad data, you will get bad results. So with the garbage in and the garbage out uh, model. 
So that's where we really look at. We want to validate uh, our data. We want to make sure that it is consistent, that we can generate it in the most efficient way. So next slide. Uh, sorry, we're, we're missing one, I think. Where's, yeah. So the next slide is, uh, uh, thanks, Robert. Uh, the next slide is uh, looking at why are data analytics needed? So what do we, what are we looking at? We're looking at quantitative data analytics where, where a lot of people who are in the field of VAT or, or um, uh, transfer pricing do recognize transactional quantitative data. So transactional data uh, as the source of a, a lot of the things we look at. Um, more recently, the, uh, the unified approach the OECD has uh, proposing where you slice the pie of profit uh, by using some relevant allocation keys, uh, about four or five categories, uh, is the, the more ho holistic approach, which uh, we, we, uh, we uh, have addressed in one of our other webinars where we um, compared this unified approach with a, a, a sophisticated version of a quantitative value chain analysis. Um, I think the business analytics typically talks about wall-to-wall -wall margin and uh, very interesting for the C-suite. Um, so they like to know where they actually make their money with. Um, the, the new kid on the block, so to say, and, and, and uh, Stephen uh, uh, probably disagrees with me because he's been doing this for a long time, is the forensic view on, on data analytics where um, you're basically using even more multiple sources of data to, to, which get cross-checked. And, and yes, uh, I think the forensic approach to data analytics is typically uh, that it has a higher appetite for, for outliers. Um, the, uh, the, 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 the point, and, and Stephen, step in here uh, if you want, is that, uh, for example, the, U the U.S. Uh, government or the IRS is typically looking at transactional data when it comes to transfer pricing. Um, and a lot of the thinking in, in say, the last two years by governments uh, after BAPS is uh, of a much more holistic uh, approach. Um, why is that? Well, I guess simply because if the IRS would be looking at a, a services transactions and intangible transactions or a good transaction and tries to assess whether the price on that, on those transactions is uh, in line with what third parties would ex uh, expect and accept, uh, that, that approach does not really work very well for highly integrated value chain and business models. Stephen, any, anything you want to add to that? Uh, only that uh, forensic uh, analysis is becoming, it's sort of the direction that the OECD uh, BEPS uh, action items are sort of moving in the direction of. And, you know, forensic uh, analysis can mean different things to different people. So I would lay out there that for purposes of this call, when we say forensic analysis, what we really mean is the application of economic science to your intercompany transactions. So if you think of uh, something like uh, forensic uh, laboratories or DNA technology, um, we're subjecting the intercompany transactions or the transfer pricing policy to forensic analysis, meaning we're applying economic theory um, and economic science to, to sort of check and see if, if the results are sound uh, according to economic science. So if you think of country by country action item 13, that's sort of a movement in this direction, right? Because the tax authorities, they wanna know, okay, how many revenues, uh, people, assets do we have? And what are the profits per person in different jurisdictions compared with their capability to generate those profits? That's a forensic exercise. That's an example of a forensic uh, type of analysis. And of course, we can take this a lot further as we'll discuss later on in the slide deck. Thanks. Thanks, Stephen. Uh, next slide. 
Uh, by the way, as a point of attention, if anyone has a question, you can drop your question in the chat box uh, so we can we can pick it up. Um, Robert? Yeah, so the question, uh, why do we need data analytics? Uh, of course, we want to use our data, as already mentioned, uh, to create value and that we can look at in different ways uh, when we look at uh, the business. Um, that we can understand where we generate the margin and where not, but also we can look at uh, the compliant part. We have a lot of data, we can check uh, compliance, but also we can generate that in a couple of minutes instead of uh, looking at it ourselves, which can probably take days. We can look at the same screen, so we have a common understanding. We can run scenarios. If this, then that. We can do that business-wise, we can do it uh, tax-wise. Meaning we can spend way more time on analyzing and understanding the data instead of preparing a lot of uh, sheets ourselves. Yeah, it, it enhances the brain power of, uh, of the tax team in, uh, in looking at data sets than, uh, rather than simply accepting uh, the, the data set the finance has presented to, to you as uh, because you asked for it. So I think that's uh, relatively new for tax people, but uh, certainly uh, will be will be the future. Um, next slide. Uh, one back. So this is um, um, just as an introduction. Uh, it's it's uh, if you look at data, you can look at, at data from the past. And, and you would uh, look at the descriptive analytics, so like a three years uh, analysis on uh, on CBCR uh, outliers, so country by country reporting outliers could be a, a good example. Um, I uh, I know the future focused analytics where predictive basically says I have an old uh, a, a data set from the past and I extrapolate it into the future. Whereas prescriptive even goes and says, okay, I'm, I'm using algorithms to generate data sets which reflect economic reality. Uh, so if you get into the mode of a Monte Carlo simulation uh, to assess a certain re revenue levels or cost levels of a economic activity, um, that obviously um, moves the needle uh, in terms of complexity, but also the needle in terms of value add. Um, Robert, um, I know you also uh, are dealing with uh, mostly the future focused analytics. Uh, you want to add a few comments on that? Uh, of course. So when we look at data analytics, um, most companies still tend to, uh, to see ERP system and also BI tools as a black box. And with uh, descriptive analytics, that is still can be okay. But when we look at uh, the future and especially prescriptive, then it's really important that we understand what the software is doing, what artificial intelligence is doing. If we do not understand it, it can be instead of a big opportunity, a big risk. So it really uh, increases uh, the need of knowledge about uh, the BI tool. Next slide. Robert? So when we look at uh, getting the insight, uh, of course, we want to have the most efficient and the most optimum uh, system, meaning that we first need to know what is the insight, what we want to have, and that also defines the data pool we will need for it. Why do we do it? We want to make sure that we don't stress the system more than we need. Uh, so we want to have the near real time or the real time uh, information. What we see now is that a lot of companies uh, have different data sources. They have the ERP system, they have a separate VAT system, they have a separate HR system, planning system. And we need to properly collect data from all those systems. We want to collect it in the most efficient way because data needs to be uh, in near real time. Quality 
when we look at uh, quality that determines the level of detail that determines also the level we can trust uh, the data we are joining tables we are enriching data we are standardizing data for example work for a company and they have uh, the country germany and it is spelled as de deutschland deutschland so different languages and that is really polluting the data set next step is the analysis we want to understand the data we want to understand the why we want to discover trends and if we have done that we can present it in a visualization that can be in a table can be in a chart to really provide insight to senior management which of course the goal is um, where senior management uh, can understand in one minute where the company stands and also understands where to take any action Yeah, what, what uh, as, as uh, t two, two other points, uh, Robert, here. Um, one is the, the quality of data. Uh, if, if I talk to uh, corporate uh, people, uh, tax people, and uh, I ask them, so, so uh, where do you get your data from for, for headquarter cost uh, analysis? First, collect the cost and then subsequently allocate the cost to the beneficiaries. Um, in, in a lot of cases, they say we got that we got that data from finance. I said, so so, what what how knowledgeable are you on on the chart of accounts? And first first question obviously is, do you have a consistently applied chart of accounts? And 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 that is typically where handover of responsibility between finance and tax sometimes goes wrong because finance. Just understood uh, the the question from tax to be a, a, a question for data on headquarter cost. Didn't really analyze what slice of the data was was needed to to support that. Tax assumed finance was doing a perfect job, uh, and and the data uh, they got from finance is is valid all the way up to courts in in Italy where. If you if you make a mistake on data representation, it becomes a criminal charge. So 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 this is a, sort of a, a dilemma in terms of uh, of, of data governance. Uh, we get we get on um, in a, in a few slides. Uh, another point is if you if you rigorously as a tax department follow the, these these five steps, um, and you can um, as Robert already alluded on uh, also run if then scenarios. Uh, suddenly, uh, what what you were using for analyzing how to allocate profit to what location and to what legal entity suddenly becomes a um, a fully automated uh, Excel spreadsheet or even a codable version of an Excel spreadsheet, which suddenly the business and even the C suite could be interested in because it. It, it can run if then scenarios on the wall to wall margin analytics. Uh, so we've gone on quantitative value chain analysis through uh, uh, the five phases you see here uh, to find out that suddenly the, the C suite was interested in what we were actually doing for tax, originally for tax, carried so much data and, and, and created so much um, BI uh, impact that. That also the C suite was uh, was suddenly noticing tax came up with something more than just a compliance exercise. It, it actually built a model on which some of the uh, business decisions at C level could be modeled uh, on and uh, simulated on. Okay. Um, is, in the meantime, is there any question? Can you look? No questions so far. So we continue. Um, we're at slide 13. Stephen, can I give to you and Jeff the floor on, on this one? Yes. <clears throat> so so this slide short, sort of uh, shows you a data, data governance uh, framework. So we're getting sort of now into the process for uh, managing, developing, and managing, and governing, uh, controlling uh, the data. And so it's important to know that we've, we've broken this up into upstream and downstream, but these are processes that are occurring both in finance, 
as well as in tax. So you may start with the same data uh, coming out of an ERP system. Uh, generally, uh, that data may be used primarily in book accounting and, uh, you know, there's top side entries uh, for transfer pricing, let's say, or for adjustments for tax. There's a tax provision that gets computed. There's legal entity uh, and country level forecasting that occurs. So a lot of the projects, when you're going to implement a data-driven sort of tax or transfer pricing uh, policy, uh, data is very important and the governance over that data is very important. So we want to gather the data we need from disparate systems, could be an HR system, could be a finance system, could be outside <clears throat> the ERP system. We need to control and manage and govern that data. We need, oftentimes we need enterprise technology, so that's something we'll discuss later on. And then there's an execution process uh, of, okay, what are we doing with that data? So we're we're doing things like price setting and, and all of this. So let's focus on the upstream for a second and, you know, defining who can handle the data, translating and, and supporting a new process. There's new roles. So a lot of these projects that we do where we're implementing a data-driven transfer pricing process, this is a new process uh, for many companies. So beginning with the upstream, what are we talking about? We're talking about coordinating with the IT department, for instance, to identify the data that we need and how do we get that data, what format is it in, and then we need to, after collecting the data, there may be a data blending process to perform the analysis we need, could be for BEPS, could be for price setting, could be for reporting and documentation. There's a data cleansing process that needs to occur, and then there's a data formatting to put into the technology that we're going to use in order to perform the downstream processes. So let's talk about, uh, yes, any comments? Okay, so let's talk about the downstream process. So here, you know, we show pattern recognition, statistical, statistical significance, anomaly detection. So these are pieces of the downstream, but really what we're going to do is we're going to take some kind of transfer pricing engine, some kind of transfer pricing computational technology we're going to put the data that we need into that technology so that we can do things like legal entity and segmented financials that incorporate our transfer pricing and allow us to change the transfer pricing and see the impact on those legal entity uh, profit outcomes. Profit monitoring and forecasting, price setting, simulation and testing, performing what if analysis, preparing journal entries. And then we get into, okay, if we're going to do this what if analysis and we want to measure our compliance, uh, you know, our compliance posture, now we're going to start looking at, okay, are there variances? Um, are there anomalies? And is there a statistical significance to these? And are there patterns that we can see where maybe we're non-compliant or we have substantial opportunities uh, to improve our transfer pricing? So, this is sort of the data governance process that you need to go through in terms of upstream and downstream and then the functions associated uh, with each and identifying, for instance, you know, who, who performs which process uh, in, in this chain. So is the same person going to be the person, let's say, that works with IT, that gathers the data and then gets the data cleansing and then gets the data into the model and then is the one that also operates the model and prepares the output of that model? Or do you need more specialized uh, skills on one side or the other, let's say? Let's say for operating the, the uh, transfer pricing engine that you're going to use to do, your, to, to do the what-if analysis and to measure your compliance uh, indicators. So that's just a, sort of an overview of the slide. We try to simplify it here, but there are a lot of underlying processes that go with this, and that'll be sort of covered in some later slides. Thanks, Stephen. Um, next slide. Yeah, this is uh, a little bit the um, uh, the data organization is a top challenge. Uh, we we say here that that sort of feeds into the governance model. Uh, so. I, I already talked about the chart of accounts. So do you know what data you get and is the data consistent uh, based on, on the internal standards of handling financial data? Um, but 
so far I haven't seen uh, a corporate uh, wide data manual and policy uh, in writing yet. I guess with with all these data analytics, especially if if it starts uh, replacing tax risk management in the traditional way, um, uh, requires uh, that type of governance on a, on a piece of paper. Uh, so so it's it's a the data organization, the governance is a top challenge. Uh, that that's basically the, the the summary of that. Organizing it uh, requires the right data architecture. I think more and more tax people, and Jeff will talk a little bit about the, 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 the nature of the, the jobs we're looking at here. Um, and modern uh, data architecture is typically cloud-based. So, so assume um, if, if, the, if, if Facebook says that 50% of, of their um, professionals will per permanently work from home after Corona, uh, that, that might happen to the tax scene as well. That obviously puts uh, a strain on on what is the work spot management, uh, not only on on the the, the the tax knowledge worker, but also on the architecture of data and tools around the, uh, around the knowledge worker. So this is a, a couple of frequently asked questions we we deal with uh, uh, in the, in the interaction with our clients. So what, what is the strategy for tax data uh, at source in the ERP or the financial system? Uh, what is the um, uh, strategy on accuracy, correctness, and completeness of data if you need to use it for tax purposes? Again, what I just said, corporate-wide data policies. Uh, a point on that is actually that the cycle could be different. So VAT would and customs might be looking at transaction or monthly cycles. So are, are much closer to the real thing in terms of timing. Uh, the transaction happens today. Tomorrow I need to file my VAT return. Uh, while corporate income tax and transfer pricing people, they typically believe in cycles of 12 months. And, and, and they do typically then also believe in, in end of period adjustments. Could be quarterly, could be yearly, uh, which sort of visualizes also that uh, tax teams hardly impact uh, and, and put data back into the ERP system, except maybe for, uh, for the typical tax provisioning work. Um, the more tax authorities get to monitor tax um, on a real-time basis, like the VAT system in, in Italy and Spain, as examples, uh, or the Brazilian tax system, if the tax revenue authorities Start doing pre-clearance on on VAT returns on the VAT uh, the VAT elements and attributes of a normal invoice from you to your clients. The more real time, obviously, tax will be involved in in the whole financial architecture and has to be. Uh, so so that is still I think a, a challenge ahead of us. Um, the, the next. Thing is book to tax differences. I think the tax accounting is is well understood, although sometimes a little bit isolated on a separate island. Uh, but they, they sometimes talk a different language, which is so mechanical that it's it's not always uh, resonating uh, to to other pieces of the tax uh, tax department. Um, yeah, the, the the data quality throughout creating a level of trust in data. I think that's an essential point. So can you rely on the data being put into the financial system? Can you rely on that as a tax department or do you um, more and more, because tax typically goes a few layers deeper than finance, do you more and more take roles of the finance department uh, in, into the tax department? These are, are the typical questions I think everyone should ask themselves and, and, and reflect on. And in terms of uh, of data architecture, so with that, um, I think we're moving to the next slide. Uh, Robert. So, 
when we look at uh, this slide is uh, already what I talked about is that we uh, that most companies tend uh, to collect data from different uh, sources. Uh, so most of the companies they store the data on a separate SQL uh, server where they combine uh, all, all the data and where they also uh, can use the data uh, of course for the financial part. But we can also look at hey we have a lot of financial data, we have operational uh, data, uh, HR, uh, other data that we can use uh, as an input for a tax compliant uh, engine. Uh, so that really automate any tax filing that we have. A tax compliance engine can prepare, can uh, check also the compliance and can also prepare the form that you need to submit to the tax authorities. So really make sure to standardize the process to minimize or eliminate any errors and to really automate the process when it's okay. When we see any errors that anyone involved, this can be IT, this can be the tax department, gets an email, hey, something goes wrong, you should act on it. I think now- Very good. That we can can also go to the next slide. Oh. So what we see here is a different view, uh, but it's more or less uh, the same. Uh, so when we look at the larger ERP systems, for example, SAP, it can do a lot. Uh, it can do more than most people tend to use. But what it cannot do is really uh, automate the process uh, from what I have in my ERP system to the filing I need to do to tax authorities. So also there, you can retrieve data from almost every ERP system. This can be SAP, can be Dynamics, can be Oracle, any other. You can combine data that you do not have in an ERP system with other sources, for example, uh, HR. That goes into a tax engine that can process all that data, that can combine, that can standardize, that can uh, enrich, that can make sure that all data is accurate, that can present it in a way that reflects all the tax forms. And especially in the US, where it is quite uh, specific, um, there it's really helpful when you have software that helps you generate the form so that you can really spend your time on making sure that it is uh, the outcome that you expect. Yeah, I think uh, just as a, a note here that we're, we're looking at a fairly sophisticated end-to-end -end tax technology system where, where typically the, uh, the tax engine within SAP will never go and deal with all these elements uh, uh, within the ERP system. So it, it's all these add-ons you see in this picture, which uh, which makes makes it an end-to-end -end solution um, that there's only a few players in the, in the market who actually deal with it. And typically the, the, you, you get into the the dangerous uh, field of uh, whenever I use the word ERP on tax, and uh, I already hear Jeff shout at me, don't use that word because ERP on tax is so massive, so expensive, so such a long uh, trail of project that we see, and, and that's what, what, what the next slides will also be addressing, uh, that people like to take uh, tax plus technology these meal uh, and, and migrate to different uh, segments and diff different uh, modules of, uh, of technology uh, step by step. So it's, it's more controllable, certainly from a head of tax and CFO's uh, perspective. Um, Jeff, anything to add from your side? Sorry, I was on mute. Um not on this slide, Steve, but um, on the next couple of slides, I, I will cover a bit more uh, around that. Okay, okay. Next slide. Steven? Sure. So this slide shows uh, some different data architecture 
technologies and it sort of it, it goes from lower left to, to upper right. And really what it's showing is if you think about um, on the lower left, the Excel, the access databases, this is standalone tax software. So there's limitations to what you can do in Excel. I think everybody knows that. Um, and it's very difficult sometimes to mistake proof an Excel model, uh, the person that might develop a complex Excel model, that person leaves the firm and then it becomes a difficult process to update, manage and control. At the far right, where we have different ERP systems, uh, such as Oracle and SAP, you can use some aspects of this, like the profitability and cost management modules in SAP to custom code and automate some processes in your ERP system. But as Stay said, that that is overkill and it's also uh, a very sensitive process that what you put into ERP is going to be sort of hard coded into the system. So let's just say uh, your company uh, divests uh, a quarter of your legal entities around the world, sells off a, a division of the business and acquires a, another business. Now you have a complete reorganization and that is going to be a massive change to your transfer pricing, that's not something you can manage uh, as a custom programming in an ERP system. And these projects tend to be, you know, in the, in the millions of dollars to do this type of work in an ERP system. So where uh, clients are moving is really into the middle. So some of these other models like Alteryx and Tableau, uh, they're, they're in between those two uh, areas. So they provide the capability and the power and the flexibility to take what would what might be dozens of Excel models with hundreds of tabs and complicated calculations reaching out to specific data sources that may or may not be updated in your uh, data warehouse. And it, it can actually combine and automate those processes into a more easily manage manageable uh, process. And Combining Tableau with that, Tableau is a visualization tool that you can take output from Altrix and show it in Tableau. And this is where you can get into the wall-to-wall -wall, uh, profit analysis for executives with, you know, bar charts and country-level hotspot uh, analysis, and, and which makes it more useful to the organization. So I'll just throw a, an example out there for everyone. So we had a client uh, that basically performed a substantially large headquarter allocation, hired a big four, cost millions of dollars, uh, took more than a year. And doing this headquarter analysis uh, for charging out around the world with you know different allocation drivers and what have you, it was so painful that what the company did was they took the output of all of that work and then they just charged that same output for five years without ever changing it or doing anything else. And they just viewed, well, we'll update this process every five years because it's so painful to do. And then you go to update the process and the person that was there five years ago is gone. And now you spend another you know, million dollar plus project to, to do it all over again. So we're trying to get out of uh, this limitation, but at the same time, the OECD with BEPS, they're actually layering on more uh, requirements to say, no, you got to, you have to do this every year. And you also have to provide us analysis that shows that it's arm's length. And what you want to see now is more dynamic, more flexible, more real time, uh, transfer pricing that's based on the data analysis that we're talking about on this call. That's a completely different scenario than doing something once and then just replicating that for five years with no changes. So we're in a different environment today, and that's where these new technologies like Altrix and Tableau are really coming to the forefront to help uh, clients better comply with these new requirements under BEPS and in more economics and data-driven transfer pricing. Safe. Yeah, I think uh, you, you have, uh, this is uh, the the left side is is uh, limit, limited because of the IT technology. The the right side uh, does put you in a 
freeze mode because all the modules within that uh, system need to talk to each other. So that, that means it's, it's going to be very uh, framed and almost frozen uh, once you, you, you've done the coding. So you're looking for those if-then scenarios, and you, you're probably also on transpising looking more at uh, uh, documenting and using these tools uh, to, to further validate and quantify your transfer pricing on a real-time base. Uh, so you get into the area of operational transfer pricing rather than the, the cycle a lot of people, while not necessarily believe in, but are still stuck in this 12-month cycle. So if you can move to more dynamic tools like the ones here, I guess that, that comes with, uh, with some cost, but certainly with a lot more flexibility and, and proof of concept that you're transferizing uh, or your VAT, GST is indeed following the business model almost real time and, and therefore gives you a good set of arguments uh, rather than to reconstruct some reality um, uh, at the end of the year when all these transactions already happened. So with that, uh, unless Jeff, you want to uh, have a, a go at this one or the next one? No, let's go straight to the next one, Steve. Um, I think there's, because the next one, there's a danger of actually repeating some of the stuff. So what I'll try and do is uh, mention some points that we haven't covered so far. So this is similar. It's It's going up from left to right. And we start with Excel at the bottom. Um, now, if we go back a couple of years before people started to really wake up to data and digital transformation projects, um, so Excel was the tool of choice for a lot of tax departments that and point solutions. Now, point solutions tended to swallow data. It's very difficult to get data out, so people used Excel. Um, now, Excel, like Stephen said, um, has proved not to be a great data repository. It just simply doesn't have the, the capability, the power. But it is a fantastic presentation tool for the presentation layer. Uh, it's still a terrific tool. So if you ever see any blogs or anything out there that says Excel will disappear from the tax function, I don't believe it's true. I think it'll, it should disappear as a, as a way of managing data. But as a presentation tool, I think it has a place for, you know, as long as tax is around. So if you start on that basis and you climb to the next step where we have Alteryx there, and I think Alteryx is mentioned there because it is the one that uh, seems to be taking the lead in the tax space. But the other ones that were mentioned there are also viable. So Looker, Tableau, Power BI, um, Information Builder, some of these other products that fit in there. Um, the only difference there is that whereas Excel, before you can do your presentation from Excel, you have to pull data into Excel. Alteryx, Tableau, Power BI, they go and look at the data in source. So you don't have to pull it anywhere before you can actually use it to, to visualize and generate business meaning from the data. So that, that's what that step is about. The third step is now, now we go back to what we did with Excel. You've actually got a custom database solution, and quite often you have to do this because it's very difficult to get uh, data uh, in good um, in good state at source. So you officially it's called um, your your tax data sensitization in ERP is not good enough. So people pull it into some kind of custom database solution. Now, as Steve mentioned, there's not many of these on the product at the moment. Uh, at uh, um, sorry, on the market at the moment. Um, some people, some tax departments are hanging off finance data warehouses or other such tools. Um, but there you're actually pulling data from source. You're sensitizing it outside of ERP for tax and then using it for analytics and reporting and for several other things. So that is the third layer. Uh, and obviously is going to apply probably to the larger companies than to the small and medium ones. Now, when we get to the fourth step, um, we're going to ERP. And again, uh, with ERP, if you go back a few years before people became data aware and digital transformation um, became a subject, most, um, 
most tax data that was inside ERP was not particularly good quality. Um, tax couldn't do it because they didn't know enough about data. Um, IT couldn't do it because they didn't know enough about tax. Um, they weren't really aware anyway of the power of data. Data was seen as a means to an end and not an asset in its own right. So um, the ERP vendors have now really latched onto the fact that actually you can do an awful lot if you just use the facilities that they provide you. Um, and that's a key point about ERP that many people miss. The ERP is really a platform that you can paint, a good data modeler can actually paint a tax solution onto. It doesn't give you much out of the box. It gives you plenty of rope to hang yourself if you don't know what you're doing with data. Um, and then if you get your data right at source, you save yourself an awful lot of pain of having to um, cleanse it, correct it, enrich it downstream. So that's why that sits on the top platform. But even that it even that it sits on the top, top platform, um, I think it's a mistake to think that uh, if you get your data right in ERP, that it's going to do everything for you. Um, I actually don't believe that's true. And the reason for that is that ERP should really focus on doing what ERP does best, and that is transaction throughput um, across the entire organization, where tax often just hangs off the back of transactions from um you know other flows like uh, p2p or order to or uh, order to cash or um you know off the financial chart of accounts and that actually there is still going to be specialist tools that you're going to need downstream in the tax function for compliance reporting filing and analytics advanced analytics so um to me that's what this diagram shows you can we go to the next uh, slide, please, Emily? But all those things are not that necessarily easy to do. Um, I talked about, you know, there's, there's traditional tax skills, there's traditional IT skills, but as you start to really get in, into the data space, then I actually believe it becomes a triangle and you need some basic data skills as well. So that includes, you know, almost going back to the academic level, so you've got some knowledge of, for example, relational data modeling, um, how data is stored maybe in a star schema in a warehouse and that kind of level of stuff, as well as the tools and the languages. So some of the scripting languages like Python or JavaScript and then SQL, which is still by far and away the dominant database language uh, for, for business data. Um, and in fact, um, Alteryx, which we mentioned, mentioned earlier, is almost entirely based underneath on the SQL data language. So if that's the case, then what we're going to need in the tax function, and now I'm talking the tax function, not necessarily the tax department, because the tax function is now tax across the entire organization. And that means all the pieces that are going on, where it hangs off, uh, you know, procure to pay, order to cash, etc. Um, we've identified four new roles that you're going to need. Now, these are roles, not people. So it doesn't mean you need four new people. Uh, some companies, you might have all four roles just in one person. And that might be a, a tax person who learns, learns something about data or a tax technologist who knows a lot about tax. Um, at the very largest companies, you might have multiple people filling um, each of these roles. But the first role, the ERP tax data modeler, is kind of different than the other three um, because that sits on the ERP side of the house and is going to be is going to look quite differently than the other ones um, because ERP, you know, on the on the upstream on the ERP side, you are dealing a lot cross functionally. You're dealing with large projects sometimes three, four, five uh, quarter length projects. Um, and you're really dealing with data modeling. So understanding relational data, you know, that that is a specific role. The next two roles, the tax data analysts and tax data mining, they're more likely to sit downstream in the tax department. So people who understand the data as it's coming out one way or another from the source systems, 
the tax analyst to make sure that it's um, in good shape. So doing correct cleanse and enrich processes. And tax data mining, well, that person is getting the, the nuggets, um, getting those golden nuggets of information at the end of it for um, to support the strategic and tactical decision-making processes that go on in tax. And the taxologist, well, the taxologist is the person that sits above all this. So uh, you can put these people in place, a data modeler, a data analyst, um, and data mining. But unless you have somebody who understands how the whole edifice hangs together and makes sure the whole thing is secure and robust and repeatable, um, and you're not reliant on one man shows, or just one person who knows everything. So the taxologist knows how that whole thing is cobbled together and hangs together and becomes integral to the tax function overall. So those are the new roles that you're looking for if your tax function is to become digitally aware and, tax, and, and data driven. So is there any questions at that point or additional comments? So far, no questions. Um, a, a, a little bit the obvious question from my side, uh, uh, Jeff. Uh, I know um, the, the the recipe for, and we we already showcased that and and uh, preached that in the earlier playbooks uh, sessions, number one and two. Uh, the the recipe for a successful digital transformation process like this uh, starts with people followed by process uh, um, and, and then ultimately the piece of technology. So uh, at, do you want to sort of um, give a few thoughts on that as well? Because I think so far we've talked a lot about software solutions and data, but I think it, it all starts with the human being. If the human being doesn't change in its interaction with uh, with processes and, and, and technology, I think you can uh, uh, buy the most optimum technology, uh, design the most beautiful uh, processes, uh, but if the people don't follow, it, it will be a failure after all. So any any pointers for, for that sequence? No, sure. Uh, it's actually very simple. Um, so in the beginning, if we go back, say, 15 years, when, when tax technology first really became a thing, uh, and this is, I mean, beyond point solutions. Point solutions have been around 30 years, you know, a solution to help you with your uh, corporation tax or income tax, for example, but, but really getting the hang of technology. So in the beginning, what people would do is they just buy a solution, a tax engine or you know, ERP has got tax functionality and they would just expect the technology to, to have the answer. Um, and in fact, that's my history. So my history is that I started in this industry almost 20 years ago. I built a company installing tax engines and tax compliance products and we were very successful. We grew to 30 consultants and a $4 million turnover across three countries within three and a half years. But we did technology in isolation and about six or seven years into that company, I realized that actually we weren't supplying our customers with what they really needed. Um, we do the best technology you could possibly imagine, do a great job, cost them a lot of money, install a good technical solution, but the tax manager was still not happy. Then we discovered that, okay, um, we sold that company and then started to look at the missing piece. And the missing piece is really People, process, and technology must work together in lockstep. And for that to work, the people and the technology um, have to work together, which means the people have to have a degree of digital awareness and be tech savvy. Sometimes just at the governance level, if you're you know, right at tax leadership, the lower down the, uh, the tree you go, the more you need to have actual hands-on experience of the tools or an understanding of how data works. But going forward, if, if, you know, if, if there's anything that's been a break and been a barrier to tax departments really moving forward and stepping into the digital age, it is this, it's this lack of understanding about how people process and technology must work together around data. 
if you know what's going on with your data, you know what's going on with your digital tax function. And that's just the way it is going forward. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Jeff. Uh, I'm looking at time and I see we're approaching uh, five minutes to target almost. So let's move on. Um, we have a few examples. Um, we have one question which we will have for the end. If we go through the examples, Uh, first one is pretty straightforward. Country by country reporting outlier. You make more than one and a half million EBIT line or profit before income per uh, FTE. You at least have all eyes on you by the government officials. Uh, so this is a pretty simple, uh, straightforward uh, usage of data. CBCR is the first across border uh, data defined. A universally defined data set that tax authorities worldwide share with each other. So people call it a transferizing document, but it's really the stepping stone for, for governments uh, to start collecting much more data. So this will evolve into a universal tax audit file as, as we um, uh, will yeah, see governments uh, adding more and more data sets they want to lay their hands on to this. So the next one. Yes, Dave. Um, so I'll cover this in uh, a minute. <laughs> so forensic economic analytics is, as I uh, uh, mentioned before, the application of economic science to your transfer pricing and to the data to produce tax efficient and risk efficient transfer pricing. So the two goals of doing something like this is to increase the efficiency of your transfer pricing using the data and the technology, and also understanding your compliance risks and being able to mitigate those. Um, there's a whole body of work underneath this, uh, including academic papers and 200 slide decks that go into 50 plus modules uh, for the analytics models that we use for this. And I'll just throw a, a really quick uh, couple of examples. So some of the projects we do in this area reach the level of the CFO and even the CEO because they have an impact uh, to, the, to the taxpayer's um, re uh, profit uh, income per share. Uh, some of these projects are that large. So example, you have a limited risk structure around the world and then you have a sales shock where your revenues drop by 30 or 40 percent you have a worldwide loss, but you're paying, you know, 300 million euros of tax all over the world because of these limited risk structures. Can you get out of that? Yes. Uh, and this would involve the application of, of economic science and, and basically economic analysis uh, to change and make more variable your transfer pricing to comport uh, with the economics of your market and your customers and your intercompany transactions. And it's the idea that limited risk is not risk-free and maybe uh, cost reimbursement is an appropriate outcome under certain conditions, but you need the economic analysis to support that. A similar thing would occur with charging a fixed royalty to an entity when there's no non-routine profit uh, present in that economic relationship and that can cause problems. So again, having a more flexible and dynamic license fee structure, it's those kinds of things that we do in this process. Um, so I'll leave it there, but there's a whole body of work underlying forensic economic analytics. And it's really a subject for a whole nother call or, or webinar at some point in the future for anyone who's interested in learning more. Great, uh, Stephen. Um, the next slide is um, a, a slide uh, by a company called Signet, uh, and they basically have analyzed source tier and reporting tier, and what, what is the optimum software in the middle. So again, another example, I think uh, if we skip maybe uh, slide 24, 25, uh, Robert, you wanna say a, a, few, uh, a few words on, uh, on SASVIA? 
Yeah, so when we talk about uh, Sophia, that is a tool that covers uh, the descriptive until the prescriptive part. So that means that you can do scenario planning, but uh, also a tool that we are working now on is to have the compliance on transpricing uh, just in one minute. So meaning that you have within your TP uh, do documentation, you have a specific method, you have a specific percentage. Uh, and that is with the tool what we can check with your ERP system uh, on uh, a monthly base or a weekly base if you are still in line with your documentation. So really providing solutions uh, on uh, transfer pricing and reducing your time. So with having said that, the last slide basically is uh, what to do next. Uh, well, obviously uh, we, we try to push too much into one hour, so apologies for that, but I think you got the, the, the notion of, uh, of what data, uh, architecture, data analytics, data definitions all means to the world of tax. So uh, one of the questions I, I like to address from the audience, there's a lot of automation projects are failing out there, mainly due to dimensioning problems, too big and fails. Um, and, and somehow a lack of overall vision, missing the TP way beyond tax. Uh, what are your feelings on late evolutions? Um, anyone, maybe Jeff, you wanna uh, comment on this uh, question from Philip? Jeff, are you still there? I think he may be on mute. Yes, I think uh, he might be on mute. Well, uh, uh, let me take this one. I think, Philip, you're right. Uh, the dimension and mentioning problems too big and fails uh, or too small and lacks transformational impact. So you, you need to uh, get the right backing by, by C-suite and, uh, and CFO. Uh, the end-to-end the -end solutions only work for, have worked for a few but only if they follow this uh, people process technology sequence. So getting the people uh, mobilized and, and in, incentivized and inspired even uh, is, is what, what we also uh, notified in the, in the first playbook session where we said uh, we take your people through user experience days so they, uh, we, we sort of make, an, make them go through self-assessment, how good are they really on tax and technology, really Put them in a, in a defreeze mode uh, to uh, an, an inspirational mode to see technology is not a threat but actually an, a nice opportunity to uh, start a new career in, in tax and and certainly the vision from the top uh, TP way beyond tax especially as uh, tax can contribute to the business reality and even to the level of helping the c-suite modeling the I tools uh, certainly has opened my eyes that uh, that that is also the way to go because if you help through your data ana analytics the CFO and the C-suite making uh, better business decisions based on tools you develop, I think you just uh, found yourself a, a sweet spot and a high ranking um, with with the boards and not uh, just been seen as a as a tax compliance exercise from the beginning. With that, um, I would like to thank all of you for hanging in there. Uh, sorry we uh, overrun the, the hour. Um, we will be back with a few more um, webinars coming up, one on financial services uh, next coming weeks, and uh, the other one, uh, which is uh, a session together with Keith Brockman, the global head of tax, who is dealing from the Americas with uh, the practicalities of tax six and how the corporate corporates like the one he's working for dealing with uh, with the governance around Act 6 uh, will be interesting uh, topics uh, for the coming weeks. So please uh, stay tuned and uh, register yourself if you want to participate. Again, thank you and have a nice day. And uh, thanks to Robert and Jeff and Stephen for their uh, contribution of today. Bye-bye.